Mayor Bowser has set a goal to add 12,000 new affordable homes by 2025, and UPO is committed to partnering with development to meet this goal. We are supported by UPO's 57-year-long legacy of fighting poverty with a comprehensive spectrum of programs, including permanent supportive housing, community reinvestment, community health, <coughs> advocacy, early education, job training and placement, youth development, and a variety of other programs. We serve 55,000 residents each year, and we invite you to learn more about us at www.upo.org. Tonight, we look forward to a lively and informative <coughs> panel discussion led by our moderator, Mr. Ambrosia. Ed confronts DC's major challenges from ending homelessness to strengthening our schools for all students. He has led the work of the DC Fiscal Policy Institute since its inception in 2001, working alongside community leaders to make life better for DC residents. Under his leadership, DC FBI has become the primary source of independent information on the DC budget and one of the most influential policy organizations focused on the district. Had no success. His work at DC FBI led to the creation of the largest state level earned income tax credit for the working poor, expansions of funding for affordable housing, and the establishment of an independent financial review for all proposed business tax breaks before they are considered by the council. Please join me to welcome Mr. Evans here. Thank you, Dee Dee, and thank you all for being here. Um, I imagine many of you have had uh, a long day already. I was talking to somebody who just started their day at 5 a.m., but is pumped to be here, and I hope you are as well. Um, I hope you leave tonight um, educated, but also um, engaged and excited about doing something to address the city's enormous affordable housing challenges. And we are, um, you are really fortunate that UPO pulled together uh, an amazing panel of folks to contribute to this conversation. Um, and I do, I do just want to start by um, thanking UPO for all the great work that it does um, and for honoring the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend, but really in, in the work that you do day in and day out um, in, in holding a, a forum on important issues. I think this is the second year in the row that you've done that. It's a great way to kick off the weekend. And of course, great welcome to Javier Thomas, who is the new leader at, at UPO. So I think we can, we can all relate to the city's affordable housing challenges because we know them personally and we see them around us all the time, right? Um, so I live in Brookland and I've been there for almost 30 years and um, when I moved in, you didn't find a house that was more than $200,000 in Brookland. And now you can't find any, a garage that's worth, that, that would buy, you can buy for $200,000 in Brookland. And we all have been in our neighborhoods where we've seen home prices triple and quadruple in the last decade and rents that are shocking for apartments that are amazingly small. And, and we see this in, throughout the city, and there are just so many statistics and signs around us all the time, right? Last year, D.C. got the unfortunate honor of being the place with the number one level of displacement, with 20,000 black residents being pushed out of the city over the past decade. The Urban Institute says that we need 50,000 more affordable rental units over the next decade just to serve the current population. The latest attention to attend encampments, which are growing all over the city all the time, is it's just a shameful, right, daily reminder of how our prosperity has had really, um, really awful downsides. Uh, and as a prosperous and progressive city, we can and should do better than that, right? That's right. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight, because we know that when families spend every penny they have on rent each month, that everything else in their life suffers. There's no food in the refrigerator. They don't have money for bus fare. Their children aren't going on field trips. They're not getting the medicine that they need. Their mental health suffers. We know that when families move a lot and face eviction or homelessness, that those are enormous traumas that have a lot of effect on children and their ability to succeed in school. Those are things that are hard to recover from. And that's why it's really important that we all focus on making sure that everybody in the city has affordable housing as a stable foundation for their lives. And so I would, with that, I think we'll, we'll kick it off. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists briefly and then throw out an opening question for them. So I do know them all, but I'm gonna read a little bit from their bio to make sure I get all the details right. So starting closest here to me is David Bowers, Vice President, 
and Mid-Atlantic Market Leader for Enterprise Community Partners. His work includes facilitating affordable housing and community development transactions and policy implementation in collaboration with public and private sector stakeholders in the Baltimore and D.C. metro areas. Uh, Derek Hira, next, is a professor in the Department of Public Administration and Policy at American University and the founding director of their Metropolitan Policy Center. His research focuses on neighborhood change with an emphasis on housing, urban politics, and race. He's the author of two books, including the one that I know most well, Cappuccino, Cappuccino City, which came out recently, and is currently working on another manuscript entitled Roots of the Riots, Race, Policy, and Neighborhood Inequality. Kimberly Driggins is on a return, uh, a a return uh, tour in D.C. She's the new executive director of the Washington Housing Conservancy. She's a career-long community development advocate and urban planner. She served previously as the associate director of citywide planning for D.C. government, but most recently was the director of strategic planning for the city of Detroit. Thank you. Thank you. Fernando Lemos has more than 25 years of experience in the nonprofit housing and economic development sectors. He's originally from Paraguay, but is a longtime resident of the district with extensive experience working with the Latino community. Thank you, Fernando. So I'm going to ask some questions, and the panelists will answer whoever feels the best equipped, uh, but we'll also have some time at the end for questions and answers. So the first question is, that, uh, is just a general one to all the panelists, and we will start with David and work our way down, which is just to introduce yourself, tell us briefly about your work in this space, and tell us one thing that you think is critical for us to know and for the city to be doing better when we think about affordable housing. Great. Thanks, Ed. Many thanks to UPO, the entire leadership, for hosting this event, and um, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, very quickly, as Ed said, the organization I work with, work we do, is really focused on helping enhancing life outcomes with a focus on housing, and particularly housing that serves low and moderate income uh, residents and that's connected to good opportunities, good transit, good health care, good education, and good economic mobility and job options. Uh, we were founded actually by the late Jim Rouse, real estate developer, uh, out of a, that really came out of a faith-based encounter in the Church of the Savior community here in Washington, D.C by three women who said to Mr. Rouse they wanted to preserve a couple of buildings that was affordable for uh, low-income folks. They must have had a crystal ball because this was about 40 years ago. And Mr. Rouse did what any good developer would do, ran the numbers, said it doesn't work. Uh, and they I always say never doubt the power of three women in a community of faith. So they went off and raised and put down a non-refundable deposit on the buildings and then said, uh, what are you willing to do, right? And so it changed Mr. Rouse's life and he thought, what if we couple um, that kind of faith and uh, commitment to serve with for-profit business discipline. So out of that was born Enterprise Foundation, now called Enterprise Community Partners. We do financing work, we do policy work, uh, and we do systems work. And that's the reason I share that story, the corporate DNA, because it really ties into the, to the answer to the second part of the question, what do we most need to do? Um, I think we need more heart. When people ask me what the biggest challenge is, I always say it's, it's a lack of vision a lack of heart, lack of urgency. And so what we have is not a technical problem. We don't have a head problem. There are plenty of smart people who know how to do a deal with seven, eight, nine layers of financing. I see some of them in here, um, right? They just said amen in their own sad way. Um, but but uh, it's a heart problem. And I'll stop with this. The um, I was I was on the team, the football team at Woodrow Wilson High School here in D.C. Um, I did, didn't say I played, I said I was on the team, <laughs> full disclosure. So uh, I'll never forget Coach Thomas, one of the coaches, said to a young man who was a receiver in the spirit of uh, NFL playoff football, a young man was fast and built like a Greek guy, but he was scared to come across the middle. He had alligator on him, he would pull it back, and he said to him, son, he said, I can teach you technique, but I can't teach you heart. And so for me, that has stuck with me for 30 plus years, what we have here um, it's not a head problem. Our biggest challenge is do we have the heart to serve those people who we know have urgent, compelling human needs? Um, and that's a gut check question. Everything else follows from that. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, Derek Hira from American University. Uh, I first want to start by thanking Andrea, Didi, 
uh, all the UPO staff, the board members, Ed for facilitating this group, um, and, and just the fact that we're here and we're talking about affordable housing is a big shift, not for the country, but for UPO. I mean, UPO started by doing advocacy work and then has been entrenched with important social service work uh, with individuals, but now as an organization, understanding that it's that direct services, but also it's the house that people live in. It's the community that surrounds the house and those services, and that is just as important as the basic services that UPO is providing. But now UPO is ready. As David said, they, they need to have some heart, uh, and they need to have some grit. Because if you want to affect affordable housing policy, you're going to have to piss some people off. Uh, because you got to get more money. As David said, I mean, this is advocacy is important in terms of getting the resources that are necessary to get the 12,000 units that Miro, Mayor Miro Bowser wants. Uh, but as Ed said, that the Urban Institute said we need uh, 50,000 affordable housing units. And that's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of advocacy to bring that about. Um, so I run something called the Metropolitan Policy Center. We study, a lot of our work is looking at Washington, D.C., trying to understand it as a laboratory of urban research. I went to school at the University of Chicago, so there was a Chicago school, kind of understanding development there. And a lot of people passed up on Washington, D.C. They didn't study the city because they said, that's ah, the nation's capital. Like, whatever the federal government does, that's what's going to affect neighborhood change here. And D.C. didn't have a lot of manufacturing, right, in the early 20th century. It never did. So it was always an advanced service sector economy. So, but now D.C.'s economy of today is the economy of growing cities around the country and around the world. So understanding the dynamics of politics and of economics and of neighborhood change here is so critical to understanding other cities around the world. We've moved away from the federal government, right? This is a public and private sector city. Um, so this place, though, with all the economic development that has happened here, is gentrification gone wild. No matter how you measure gentrification, D.C. ranks number one, two, or three in the, as the most gentrified city in the nation since the 2000s. So what my study, what my center tries to study is economic neighborhood development, but equitable development. We know how to do place-based development in this country. We've been doing it throughout the 20th century. We develop the place and we displace the people in place. Just need to look at Southwest, right, and what happened there in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so how do we do redevelopment and bring economic growth to underserved neighborhoods, but do it in a way that keeps people in place and ensures maximum benefit for low and moderate income people? And that's what we try to study and understand at the Metropolitan Center. And I would say one insight uh, that I think we could deploy to UPO and to the city uh, is we should be thinking about the gentrified spaces and how to keep people in place and preserve and build affordable housing in the areas that are going to gentrify, like Anacostia. Um, we have a lot of affordable housing there, but as that area gentrifies, that affordable housing is going to disappear. So we need to keep an eye on the places that are about to pop, not the places that have already popped. Uh, and so I will end it there and move to the next Great, thank you. It's actually a good segue to, to me. Um, good, good evening, everyone, and thank you, UPO, for the invitation um, to be on this esteemed panel. I think I know, know of or know personally everyone here, and I'm uh, very much a fan of all the work um, of the panelists. Uh, again, my name is Kimberly Driggins, and I'm the new executive director for the Washington Housing Conservancy. The Washington Housing Conservancy is actually a new uh, not-for-profit housing organization. We were created just last year, and I am the founding executive director. We were created um, really because of the need um, to preserve, and well, I'm sure we'll get into some of these terms, to preserve um, rental housing. And as Derek just talked about, we're actually focused on the areas um, where displacement um, is has the likely has the highest likeliest possibility of occurring. So. We have um, labeled that high impact areas, but 
that those are areas where there's access to really good transit, metro, um, quality grocery stores, good schools, where we're seeing the rates of displacement um, at a higher rate um, than other um, parts of the city and the region. We are a regional organization as well. 50% um, of our um, business or our work is committed to the district. Um, and it, it can go higher, but we have a mandate to do 50%. Um, real, just briefly, our mission is really thinking about preserving rental housing, low to mod, with a focus on moderate income. And we can talk about that. I know UPO's mission is around the, the low income, but I, I would submit that for a healthy economy, you need all income levels living and thriving in your city. And I think that DC is dangerously close to becoming San Francisco with respect to having very high income and very low income. And the missing middle, the missing income, the missing middle, the middle class, um, working class being further and further pushed out to um, the, the, the regions. So we um, are really clear on our mission. Um, I think that one of the things in terms of what I see in the field is actually a lack of innovation. And you know, we are taking some risks. We're not sure of our model. We're, we're, we're new and we're gonna um, innovate. We have a social impact investing model. Um, so there is a return on investment for the investor. And um, I think that that's, that's healthy. It's a triple bottom line. So there's a financial return, there's an economic, there's, a, there's an environmental return, and then there's a social um, return. And the conservancy is the not-for-profit operator of the housing. And I, I emphasize conservancy. We are not a developer. We're not interested in um, new construction, and we're not interested in doing um, pricey renovation. We're in the market of acquiring existing um, apartment buildings in those high impact areas and preserving the affordability that already exists. The, the buzzword right now is sort of naturally uh, reoccurring affordable housing. What that really means is that the rents are already affordable and we're looking to preserve that affordability and it's not subsidized. So our model doesn't look, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't use low income housing tax credits and we're not using federal um, incentives. So you know, we're not dipping into that pot for, um, that serves really the low income. Um, so and, and I'm gonna pause there because there's a lot to say and I will just say overall too, um, I think part of the field, what's lacking is looking at the community as a whole. And if you look at my career, I'm a community development advocate. I've also been in community planning and engagement, and I think that that's really important in this space. Affordable housing tends to be siloed, and I think that there needs to be more integration um, with other disciplines to really get what's best for the residents um, with respect to the city. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Pranav. Uh, if I can interrupt, interject for just a second, can you, to help, that was a, a great introduction, to help make your work super concrete, can you tell us like, some of the neighborhoods that you think fit into that definition of where you are most likely to have your success in preserving affordable housing? Sure, well, I mean, it's most of D.C. Okay, well, that's <laughs> good. It's, it's out there everywhere, yeah. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, Montgomery County, parts of Prince George's County, um, Arlington, City of Alexandria, um, Fairfax. Um, so basically the DMV, I mean, what we know of it. We don't go as far out as Loudoun, um, but I'd say, like, Fairfax County is probably about as far as we're going at this time. Hi, Hi. Thanks for the invitation, and I appreciate you being here. Um, NICASA is a non-profit organization that was created 29 years ago. And the intention of NICASA was to preserve housing in the community when they, in the District of Columbia people were leaving the city. And uh, we came in to uh, start to create a housing, and our focus, original focus, was in preserve single family home that was very affordable uh, and basically was given to us and in order to serve not only the uh, community, the existing community as well the immigrant community that was moving aggressively at that time in the district. After that, uh, some tenants came to us and said, can you help us to develop co-ops? And we had to say something very clear here, that the city, DC, have a special law that was very helpful to the tenants 
to preserve their housing. And the TOPA law was something that really was helping uh, the tenants and, and really was helping to create decent housing and empower the tenants to control their housing. That was our one of our strong motivation. Uh, at that point, I can tell you, we bought, uh, the tenants were bought a unit for $11,000. And nothing, nothing like that you can do with that. And, and I'm talking about World One and uh, Columbia High. <clears throat> uh, so then we, the needs came to us to say, uh, help us to maintain our housing, but we can and we don't want to be co-op or square control. So Mikasa moved into to create and preserve through rental. We are doing some rental units we are maintained. One of the things that we are in negotiating with the tenants, we try to preserve housing for over 40 years of preservation. Not only 15 years, you know, insists. And the city is very, very supportive of that idea. So <coughs> then we came and now we are confronting a new situation that is as very clear in our community is that the population is aging fast, very fast. Mm -hmm. We start to have people who are getting into the situation they, they can maintain, take their rent control, for example. I'll give you an example. Because the income is only up to $700. And if operating a building is $600, uh, uh, $600 a month. So with that income, you can preserve the existing house. So we are moving. And, and we are dealing with a population and the city that is not only real gentrification, but also deal with a situation of aging and uh, employment. We talk, the city has a high level of employment, but not for the people that we serve. And we have to deal with the facts right now, and we are confronting that situation. <laughs> we are I'm sorry. Uh, we are confronting with that uh, issue in our community. So with that, I think we are, we are open for the discussion, but I want to emphasize that that is possible here because we have a top up. In California or in any other big cities <coughs> in the country, we don't have it. I am part of this organization that's called NALCA. It's a national association. And we are dealing with uh, affordability and um, displacement in everywhere in the, in the country. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to make a, a rule up on the fly here, which is which we didn't have talked before in advance. But in the um, spirit of trying to get to as many questions as possible, I'll throw out a question and then maybe have one or two folks answer, unless there are more who have a burning thing they want to say. But let's just aim for a couple responses. So. Jump in Jeopardy style if you feel like you have a great answer. So the, the first is um, that Mayor Bowser uh, has been a, a big champion of affordable housing. She campaigned on it and she followed through on it. Uh, her signature commitment has been $100 million for the Housing Trust Fund every year, which has actually increased. And we talked about she's committed to 12,000 new affordable units over the next five years. Yet, we all know that's not enough, right? We see around us that we are not doing enough. So my question to the panelists, to two of them, uh, is sort of tell us what you think the right scale is, however you might want to define that, the time timetable, numbers, whatever it might be, and talk a little bit about how we get there, what's the role of the public sector, the, the government, and what's the role of the private sector, what can they do? Who wants that? So, so I'll jump in with a couple things in terms of one, I think quantifying the needs. So I'll go back to Ed and that, um, you know, the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, your shop did a report, I guess, about a year ago with some recommendations about uh, close to $3 billion, I think over a period of time, $290 million a year, if I'm remembering correctly, over 10 years. Uh, so groups like Fiscal Policy Institute, back when Vince Gray was mayor, the uh, Deputy Mayor's Office commissioned the uh, Urban Institute, I believe it was, to do a study looking at how much was needed, and I think their estimate was 3 to $5 billion, right, over a certain period of time. FBI's more recent work. Uh, we talked about the numbers that Urban Institute just came out with. So I think that, in the Council of Governments, I think that what we need to look at is what is the actual need, right? How many folks are, are unhoused? How many folks are living severely cost burden, paying more than half of their income for their housing? 
um, how many folks are, are in a situation where they could get displaced, to really quantify at a whole number, and groups have done that to, to answer that part of the question. So that information in various ways is out there. So then the question then becomes for us, for the, the mayor, for the council, for us as citizens who live here, is how aggressive do we want to go on treating this, this issue, right? And so it is, I think for us in the time frame, I would suggest we need to look at really a shorter rather than longer time horizon. I get it, it takes time to do development, uh, but particularly when it comes to preservation, having specific targets for any units that may be expiring that have covenants on them, and then having targets for naturally occurring affordable housing, obviously having shorter timelines to try to house anyone who is unhoused, the shorter timeline. There are, there are jurisdictions like Arlington, Virginia, for example, had a, a, literally an award-winning plan, but I think their time horizon was 15 or 20 years. And so, as Fernando said, you know, years of, that, that's great if you've got a long time. Things are moving quickly, the market's moving fast. So we don't have 20 years. Somebody who's unhoused, they don't have 20 years to wait for, right? Somebody who's paying more than half of their income for their house, they don't have 10 years to wait for relief. So I think that goes back to what I said at the beginning, this lack of urgency. So to me, it's shorter time frames. Look at the data that's been done by several groups, and then us asking a gut check question. Are we willing to commit those resources from the public sector and from the private sector. Part of the work has to be engaging banks, foundations, and part of that work has been going on with an effort even led by uh, the Housing Leaders Group of Washington and other efforts around uh, a billion dollar challenge was announced last year to get a billion dollars of new money in this region by the end of this year. New money, public money, and private money, half and half. So we have to have real hard questions in boardrooms, the foundations, banks, private sector employers, Right, as well as the public sector to say, are we willing to solve for the problem or are we just trying to address an issue? And that's different. We have to, I think, hold feet to the fire. Are we trying to address an issue or are we trying to solve for the problem? If we're trying to solve for the problem, let's say, what is the scale and scope? And then go there. And if we're not, when we come up short, then we have to just have honest conversations with ourselves and say, we understand this number of people are suffering but we may just say, we're only gonna help this many, right? Let's just be honest about it. And let's talk about what that means for us. It's a hard issue, as you said. Anybody else wanna take that one on? Sure, the next question. No, go ahead, jump in. Uh, yeah, please, sir. Uh, Ed, it was interesting you mentioned uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Bowser, and, and the $100 million commitment to the uh, trust fund, which is fantastic, right? Some states don't even have that type of money. So we have a very robust uh, social safety net for affordable housing in D.C. that most cities and most states don't have. But the need is so great here. So we need more. So it's not like we don't have a base. We've got a pretty good base, but that base has to grow. And it made me think when, when you ran for office, you, you asked for 200 uh, million in uh, the affordable housing trust, uh, uh, affordable or the housing production trust fund. But we think about what the need is, David just talked about. We've got all these studies saying how much need, and it's, yeah, it's in the billions, right? I mean, just for the city. The city put out their you know, um, public housing redevelopment plan recently. Uh, they talked about their 2,600 units that need to be upgraded of public housing, and that will cost 2.6 billion just for some public housing. Uh, so if we go beyond the public housing and we're going to build the 12,000 or 50,000 units, then let's do the math. We're talking billions and billions and billions. So some of that money I think we can get from the city, right? But we've got to go beyond the city because where does a lot of our affordable housing money come from? The federal government, right? And we've been <laughs> gutting our affordable housing policies. Uh, but we do have some presidential candidates on the Democratic side that have proposed a $1.2 trillion housing plan. Uh, another one that has proposed uh, a half of a $500 uh, billion. So we've got to advocate at the city level, but also we've got to take it national, because the national level is going to redistribute the resources uh, here. So locally, the $100 million trust fund, it's got to go to at least 
200 million, just to be symbolic that we care about this issue. We also have to float some long-term bonds. We do long-term bonds for schools, for pools, for education. What about for affordable housing? The city of Portland, their voters issue bonds 250 million for exclusively for affordable housing. The Portland Metro reason put together a bond referendum for 650 million. So almost a billion. But that's what it's going to take. It's going to take the city and the city population to vote for more resources into affordable housing. And we need to get resources from the surrounding counties that have more money in, to some extent than, than the city and pool those things together to make things happen. We also have some, we have the inclusionary uh, zoning policy. In Washington, D.C., it's been on the books, but it's a watered down policy. You know, if, if something gets built over 10 units and the d density goes higher, uh, the developer will put in, you know, 10% of the gross residential area towards affordable housing. Well, in New York City, they put 20% down. Mm -hmm. Also, the units that do get created in inclusionary zoning go from 60 to 80% area median income. Basically, people who make 65 to $85,000 a year. Should our affordable housing go to people at that income level? In New York City, it's at 40% of the area of median income. So we've got to produce more units, but also for people who have the greatest need. And who has the greatest need here? People 50, 40, 30% of the area of median income. Mm -hmm. But we are producing affordable housing for people who make 60, 70, and $80,000 a year. So we've got to reform some of our current policies that are on the books if we're going to serve the people that have the greatest need in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Eric and, and David. Um, so in addition to needing more affordable housing and housing targeted on folks who need the most help, the, the, que the question of where we build affordable housing is also incredibly important. Um, I think we all know that low-income families and families of color are the most resilient people that we know, most resourceful and resilient, and that low-income communities are also incredibly resilient, but they also face enormous stresses, and if we build all of our affordable housing in the poorest communities, that's a challenge. We also know from lots of research that when families are able to move into areas of lower poverty and less stress, that children are, do better in school and are more likely to succeed as adults. Uh, and yet in D.C., we know that of the affordable housing that's been built in the last, whatever, four or five years, one half of them, one percent is in Ward 3. And that's only because we have inclusionary zoning and they were required to put it there. There's often community resistance, there's high real estate costs, there's all sorts of areas. So my question to some of the panelists here, whoever wants to answer it is, how important do you think is it not only to find more money for more units and well-targeted units, but to, to make sure they're going throughout the city and how do we, and what are the keys to making sure that that happens? Well, I think it's incredibly important to have the housing be all over the city and the region in terms of affordability. Um, you know, I've been in this city, I was, I was in D.C. for 20 years before I left um, for four, and, um, you know, so I've seen the city go through cycles, and when I moved here, we were in a slow to no growth market. And I remember some of the conversations, and I know that um, the concentration of affordable housing was in Ward 7 and 8, and there was great resistance to more housing in those areas. I realize that that's, that's changed a bit, but um, part of it um, is really real estate and where the dirt is the cheapest. And so that's where you end up getting the concentration of affordable housing, is where it's the cheapest to build. Um, that's historically been the case. I think that the city has come a long way with its policies and um, inclusionary zoning is one. I know they're talking about ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Um, I think where we are as a country, we are thinking about the deconcentration of poverty, we are talking about mixed income neighborhoods, and as Ed talked about, um, there's a body of research out there that, that really um, proves or demonstrates that there is significant benefits to mixed income neighborhoods and where they are. So, I mean, the short answer is, is we, we definitely need it throughout the city, and I think that you know, I haven't seen, um, you know, I've been really impressed um, upon my return about the conversation. And I was at a, a meeting in Ward 3, I think it was one of the last comp comprehensive plan meetings where, you know, they had um, 
someone from Harvard University that was talking about this research, and I mean, it was, it was a packed, it was packed. I mean, it was at Wilson High School. And, you know, I, I really think that we do have an opportunity to do things a bit differently. I think you know, some of the challenges are when you're in a strong growth market, when you're in a high growth market, it's just, I mean, I've seen New York be challenged by it, I've seen San Francisco be challenged by it, I've seen Boston, and I honestly think we have more tools. I mean, I think that we have more tools um, at our disposal than those cities, and so part of it gets back to the heart that David talked about, but also <coughs> really being intentional about the interventions and making sure that we have a diversity of interventions to help meet the challenge. I, I think is that we need to focus and make an effort to maintain the housing where the people are. Sorry. We have, because I think it's, they, they don't have the value to that location to where they are. And if we start to think about where right now, uh, we say Columbia High is too expensive, we are, we are helping the displacement. We are part of the, the system that will increase the people and relocate it. We have to be very careful about when we talk. Now, we have, because we, we, we find that it's easy to develop a affordable housing in these particular areas where we develop the affordable housing and then people move into there. And we are eliminating and basically uh, be part of the gentrification, if you want to call it, or help them. <coughs> the other thing that I find very difficult is how do we define and how we define affordable housing? Mm -hmm. What is the terms that we do affordable housing? Because everyone uses the term affordable housing. And I will tell you that based working on the ground, we find that people are living in Three or four family living in, in one house, and they pay, they still paying 40, 50 percent of the income. Hmm. So, what did we define? We, you were to mention about 30 percent, and I think that we have a large population that is below 30 percent, that is in between the 20s and, and less. And that's what we have to look at and say, what do we do with this population and how we maintain it? You know? As a kid who grew up in War Three and just moved back to War Three, um, so a couple of things come to mind. One is there's got to be, in addition to small thinking, one of our biggest challenges is to me the lack of honest conversation, right? So it's going to be very interesting, that, and I appreciate and respect the fact that the mayor has pushed this conversation, right, and leadership in the city to say, are we really who we think we are? Right? And so there's going to have to be more and more of this honest conversation about, do we really want folks who are poor? I always say, we put the Wonder Woman truth belt on folks. And you said, you got a choice. You have somebody who made a family that makes $200,000 or a family that makes $20,000 living next to you. What you gonna choose? Right? Folks not gonna say out loud, I want the person with the household making 200K, but really, honestly, a lot of folks, that's probably what your honest answer is, right? Then you gotta deal with issues of race, right? Folk who don't want to have folk who look a certain way around them, and that crosses a lot of lines. So I think that having real, honest conversation, right, is going to be essential to this. So that, I think that's, that's part of it. The other piece is the notion about preserving, I'm going to separate preservation from production. So I've been in meetings around the city over the years where people have said, folks who lived in Ward 7, Ward 8, Right, parts of Ward 5 would say, hey, we got more than our fair share, right? And don't bring it over here. Well, the issue around preservation of existing affordable housing with covenants or that's naturally occurring, quote unquote, if we don't preserve that housing now, we can see what will happen. You want to go down on 8th Street, 8th and 8th, when I was growing up, was where the woman got tragically, right, raped, sodomized, and killed. You didn't go down 8th and 8th. You can't afford 8th and 8th now. You want to go to Trinidad, right? Trinidad was where it was rough and tumble. You can't afford Trinidad now. So if we don't go to certain, that Congress Heights, <laughs> Anacostia, you next. Derek talked about it earlier, right? It's coming. The train is coming. The wave is coming. So if we don't do preservation there, right, folks will get displaced. So that leads to my next point, which is this notion of, and I get real hot about this. Derek touched on it earlier, development without displacement. To me, on some level, it is racist 
to say, I got to sit next to a white guy to get educated. Right? Because that's what's really implicit in that. And I get the data and the research. I get it. Right? But on some level, the point is, remember when Adrian Fifty was mayor? And the chancellor said, we need to bring, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially she said, we got to bring more white families into our school system if we want it to be successful. What the hell? I'm a DC public school grad. What the hell? Right? But that's the thinking. Right? Because they got more money. They can really peel that back. Why? They got money. We got to make sure the poor colored kids get around them so they can get more opportunity. Right? How about you come in and in the neighborhoods where we live, give us good facilities, give us good teachers, give us the services we need, because damn knows we can learn just as I can learn just as well as they can. Amen. Right? Give me the shot. Give me the research. And the reality is, if you come into my ward, Ward 3, and all of a sudden say, we're going to move all the poor folk because we want them up at Wilson, we want them up at Deal, we want them up at Merch, we want them up at Lafayette. We're going to have to move them up there in order to make sure they get educated. That ain't happening, Chief. Not in America in 2020. So just practically speaking, that's not going to happen. But if we peel that back, say to me as a poor child, say to me as a black child, say to me as a brown child, that I can learn, right? That I can get a job. That I don't have to go to Ward 3, that we're going to make Ward 8 better. We're going to make Ward 7 better, Ward 5 better, and bring the amenities, bring the opportunities, but be intentional about it, right? So that whether you're in, remember, now there's some political talk in this town. Every school's going to be like Alice D. Right? Remember that? I don't, I don't hear a lot of people, right? right? There's something in that. So this, to me, is where we have to have some real honest conversation, some gut checks, and some investments that have intentional protections in them. Right, to make sure that everyone's getting built up, everyone's getting developed, and that the places where the wave is coming to next get preserved so that they don't get displaced like we have seen in so many places. And that's homeowners, that's businesses as well. We want to talk about economics, right? It's not just residential, it's also black owned and brown owned businesses as well. So that's my take on that. Anyway. All right, all right what, I did tell you you would be enlightened and energized, didn't I? <laughs> David said we all know what we're talking about racial integration. Right? We know what Ward 3 looks like demographically, and we know what Ward 8 looks like. We know where the low-income people live in the city, and, and she's trying to do that. It's going to be hard. The, the liberal base up there in Ward 3, I mean, they, they talk a good game, but they're not really going to be welcoming of low-income people. They've never been welcoming of low-income people coming up there. But here's, I'll tell you what I worry about. We know that dynamic. There. What I worry about, though, is the shift now is up northwest, and what about southeast, as David said? That's where the gentrification you know, train is rolling. And even though it has a disproportionate amount of affordable housing for the city, you think it's going to have that in the next five to ten years? And if we don't keep an eye on the place that is about to gentrify, then we're, we're, it's just going to lead to displacement. So as David said, there's got to be an effort to preserve affordable housing in the places that are gentrifying. But we just talked about, we don't have enough resources. You kind of have to choose one or the other. And I am fearful the choice that the mayor and the council have made with affordable housing and trying to place it in the opportunity areas, who knows if that's you know, the truth or not, but it's taking the eye off of Ward 7 and 8. And we, and developers, are salivating to make their high rate of return on buying low, selling high. And if we don't preserve the affordable housing there, when that area escalates in terms of uh, real estate values and incomes, the people who are there now are going to be gone. Well, let me follow up then on that. Let's talk about public housing in DC. We have about 8,000 units. That's fewer than we've had before. Uh, due to federal funding to, uh, being inadequate year after year after year, many of those units are in um, deplorable, inhumane conditions, and yet people are living in them. And the housing authorities finally recognize they need to do something about it. But the plan here and in many places around the country is, is in essence privatizing public housing, turning it into mixed income housing. Think about Greenleaf development in Southwest, talk between two stadiums and the wharf, and it being under pressure to survive. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure from the housing authority, which doesn't have enough money from the federal government to say we're only going to make this work if we turn what we have into mixed income housing. So I'm sort of, I guess my question to you all is what is the future of public housing in D.C.? What should be the future of public housing in D.C.? How do we 
preserve it in those communities where it exists now. One thing that is concerning me about the participation of the private sector and the public housing is that it's, it's a short term, it's a 15 years investment or short term investment. And that obviously won't solve the problem. We've created it, we, it's pushing the problem a little bit. When we have the houses, when I was at the board of the housing authority, that problem was there. And the only, the only ones, the discussion was clear the replacement by one for one. And that means long term replacement, not just to say, okay, we are doing this and uh, I I believe, what I'm concerned about that in many of those cases, do we do band aid? We are really dealing with the issue, you know? Because the issue is that all the things that we, we haven't, I can give you an example of a case in our Northwest. There was a uh, co-op that organized and an and investor purchased the building was a co-op organization as a partner. 15 years later, the investor said, I want, I want to sell my portion. And it wasn't because the city is stepping, which is, took it too long to step in. The play, they, there was a 35 families displaced because they can't afford to secure any private financing to do their, their, uh, their, uh, their refinancing. And that's the reality. And we have to do it. In Southeast, we own the building. <coughs> we own the building in the Southeast and we pull up. And the people cannot afford to pay more than $500 or $700. And our operating cost is $650 every month. We can't support it more. I, I was the board chair of the Alexandria Housing Authority. And what Fernando just mentioned about not bringing in enough revenue to maintain what the stock that you have is reality. And that's the reality for all housing authorities across the country. And the reason is that we've been providing less money in operating and capital budgets from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to all the housing authorities across the country. So any housing authority that wants to maintain their stock, they've got to get into these public-private partnerships, and they have to work with developers to do mixed income. And what are they doing? They're selling the land. In Alexander, I mean, we sold some land to EYA, one of the large real estate developers, but they were able to maintain everyone, not necessarily at that site, but everyone was, didn't, no one had to leave Alexandria. Um, so we did sort of a one-for-one -one replacement out of the site, but a one-for-one -one replacement of the affordable housing units in the city. But most housing authorities don't do that. They just knock down the housing stock and give people vouchers. And I am worried that the D.C. Housing Authority now is thinking about the 2,600 units that they're talking about upgrading. They're likely going to raise them and upgrade other units. We talked, you just mentioned Greenleaf in Southwest. I mean, Greenleaf is right near the wharf, right? It's in between the wharf and Nationals Park. And the, those people feel the development pressures is coming in on them. And I mean, we should be making them feel secure and say, you know, out of all the public housing, we should upgrade that one and make sure they can stay in place. But you know what the housing authority is thinking about? Boy, that land that sits on, that's gold. And if we just sold that land, look at all the units that we could create elsewhere in the city. But I think we've got to really be thinking about as a city preserving public housing, particularly in the spaces where gentrification is going on. Why should new residents reap the benefit of all this economic development, but then the public housing people just get pushed because their land has become valuable? Um, but it's tough. The only way we're going to preserve affordable housing is not the advocacy at the D.C. Housing Authority. It's going to be advocacy in Congress and the presidential campaign. Uh, because I said there are two presidential candidates that, are, that have put in their policies $70 billion to upgrade the existing housing stock of public housing. So D.C., to help D.C., you've got to get involved in national housing politics. Two, two comments. We'll get to questions in just a minute. I think I don't see you, but I'll make sure we get to you first. So I'm going to ask one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, Kimberly, jump in. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily 
exclusive to public housing, but I I don't know the folks over at the Housing Authority, but I doubt if they're thinking wholesale like move. I think that they have to be strategic and think about their portfolio, which is real estate, and how to how to serve um, their constituency and also build quality housing. So I'm personally not uh, opposed to public-private partnerships when it comes to public housing. I think that's the only way, actually, it's gonna get built in a way that it's, it's, it's good housing, quality housing, and we haven't had that conversation because not all affordable housing is quality. Um, and I believe that every um, resident deserves quality housing. Um, I will say that I think we have to think about density, and I mean, I think that's something that, you know, we have this height limit um, in the city, and I think that, you know, we have room to grow. And I think, I firmly believe that you can renovate the public housing and you can add density and you can add income and make it mixed income without displacement. But also you have to think about the zoning, you have to think about some of the, the, the restrictions on development um, to allow that to happen. So I just wanted to sort of interject that into the conversation because I just, I mean, I know, I mean, I, I, maybe it's because I've been in the public sector, I was in the public sector for almost 15 years. I don't think anyone is, is thinking, you know, that we're just going to sell this land as a public official and just displace people or move them. Um, I highly doubt that's the case. But you are in a situation where your resources are extremely limited and you have to think creatively about, um, how you're going to meet the challenge and the need, and I would say we really need to look at our zoning. We really need. I, I think you know, up zoning is something that really is should be on the table, um, and there's just a lot to react to in terms of what's been said. And I, I guess we'll you know we'll get into it um, in the Q and A. But I wanted to just add that to the to the conversation. Well, I appreciate you adding that. I think we probably uh, should turn to questions and answers. I will comment though that we, there is a long history across the country of redevelopment of public housing for the number of folks who come back is a small fraction of the folks who left. That is the story of Hope Sick Out Together. So let us raise your hand if you have a question. I think we're gonna use this mic, and I'm just gonna probably just ask you to pass it around. Oh, we got someone who's gonna facilitate our questions. Keep them brief so we can get to as many questions as possible. All right, thank you so much. Um, this is for any of the panel. Um, in lieu of the, the things you're talking about, what can a community uh, like Award 8, the residents in particular, do to begin to try to um, deal with the issues around gentrification uh, that they see coming, but they don't know how to get out of the way of? Yeah, so it's a great question. A couple of things come to my mind. I think one is, I would say, kind of the organizing and engagement, right? And so what does that mean in, in real talk? So on one level, um, residents there, I think, need to get extremely organized and push members, not only, say, Ward 8 member of the council, but also the four at-large members of the council, right, as well as the chair uh, and the mayor. I think they get too locked into whoever their own ward member is. They're four at-large and, and a chairperson. And so they ought to feel as though anywhere they go in the city, they're going to, and I don't mean in a disrespectful way, but in an engaging way, know that they're gonna run into residents of wherever who are gonna be asking them, what about this? Where's more resource for this? What is the plan for this to preserve these units, preserve these businesses, to make access to et cetera, et cetera. Then the other thing is I think that there are creative ways, my own company has, uh, for the last 13 years, done a faith-based development initiative, for example. We work with houses of worship who are doing, who own land, that's undeveloped or underdeveloped who may have an interest in doing development. And so working with them, so places like Allen Chapel AMB, Matthews Memorial right near uh, Berry Farm, and others who own land, who can creatively think about land that the community owns, right? How do we then take some of that land and leverage it in some ways for community benefit? And I'll, I'll very quickly think about like Matthews. So Matthews not only built affordable housing, uh, Matthews also had as an agreement where their uh, development partner is training some folks who, in a nonprofit that was created by the church um, who will ultimately do property management on there. So now you're talking about not only housing but economic empowerment. So some of it is yes, we have to engage government and do so unapologetically. 
well, government, I don't want government to do for you. I'm sorry, government is us. They work for us. We, it's a government of other people, by the people, for the people. So when people start those arguments, why are you always looking at government? Because it's my government, it's our government. So unapologetically go to elected officials and push and press for more of the plans. But also look at what resources we control. I really appreciate, I know uh, Ron Moat, for example, making a push to try and get businesses, right? To buy up, right? Let's, let's buy, buy up the block of um, things we own. So I think getting more engaged, getting more organized, and getting more creative about how we get into things. I think it's what is important. You you can organize yourself in the, in, on the buildings, and you can offer to the to become the developer. You can buy the building to get the top of law is protecting you. So one of the things that they stay you're sitting there and waiting for the third party to come, you the, the community can be the third party because that happened in other areas when the tenants came and said we want to buy our building. Okay. Um, Great. I think we're ready for our next question. Yeah, the guy behind the uh, column here. So, uh, yeah, first of all, on the public housing, and the issue of public housing, and what they do, uh, you know, and how they take care of what is really a structural problem that HUD created, <coughs> Congress created actually, in the creation of public housing in the first place. Because the problem is that they never allowed for a reserve for replacement. So the money that they got was used <coughs> for operating and just barely for operating. So there was never any money for replacing roofs and that kind of thing. And that's why they're in the disastrous condition that they're in right now. And that's why I came up with RAD and whatever else, you know, the RAD 2, 3, wherever it goes next. But the point is, especially in the District of Columbia, the housing authority is in the driver's seat. I'm a developer. If, the, if they come out with an RFQ uh, uh, or an RFP, uh, believe me, we are going to respond. Um, and they're the ones that are going to set the rule. They're the landowner, right? And that same thing is true in Arlington, it's true in Richmond. He brings to a question. Well, the, yeah, the question is, why is, it, why, why is that a problem? I mean, if that's, how the, if, that had, if that's how the housing authorities can both uh, preserve, because if they don't figure out a way to preserve the units, the structural integrity of the units, then they're going to be. Okay, great. Let's have a panel sit in. Does someone want to answer that? Yeah, yeah, the question is why can't housing authorities act like any owner of property in a, the hottest market in the United States um, in the terms and conditions that they put forward before they sell or lease or become co developers with developers? I, so I'll, I'll try to answer that. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question, and, and you're absolutely right. In, in this region, because land value is so high that housing authorities have more control and autonomy compared to other housing authorities around the country because they have the gold, and the gold is the land, so they have a lot of negotiating room with the developer. But they have to work with the developer. The developer is going to get the construction loan. The developer is going to hold most of the risk. And so it's up to the housing authority staff and the board and also probably the city council because in any of these public-private deals, there's gap financing that's got to come typically from the public. But can all of those groups work together to maximize the benefit for low-income people? Because I'll tell you, all the people that come to that table in the private-public partnership, their primary interest is often not the low-income people. It might be rate of return. It might be taxes and, and higher property values to get more money into the public coffers. So there's, there's a whole set of issues. And if HUD just deployed the sufficient funds to the housing authority, then they could focus on the mission of just providing quality housing for low-income people. But anytime you get into these private-public partnerships, the public or the interests of the low-income people, it, it's, it gets diluted. It gets pushed to the side. So we've got to think about that. Uh, and so that would be my response. I also just wanted to respond to Mustafa's question, Mustafa, real quick, about what Ward 8 could do. We talked, David, you talked about working, uh, organizing to work with officials. Also, work to organize with the developers. Community benefits agreements. First one ever struck here was 1DC, Progression Plaza, working uh, with Chip Ellis as a developer up in, in Shaw, the Shaw area. Right? Sometimes developments take longer than the lives of politicians, meaning their elected lives. They may take two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten years 
So get in early with the development team as an organizing agency and work with the developer because they're going to be there, the residents are going to be there, but the politicians are going to come and go. So okay, working directly with the developer. So I'll just, I will quickly just interject with anyone who cares about public housing and pain. I think to your question, sir, there is a group of housing advocates who are working with the housing authority to get commitments for whatever the redevelopment occurs, whether it's public, private, or purely public, to make sure that every unit is replaced, that it's replaced at the same size, for the same income families, and that every family who leaves during the redevelopment can come back. And I think those are the kind of things that in many ways are going to be key to the success. Are we ready for our next question? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to, before I ask the question, thank UPL for having this forum this whole area of housing is new to me. But, and as an educator, I start with vocabulary. I don't think that most of our city understands what affordable means here. I know I don't. And it was astounding to me that we said we were going to put affordable housing for the replacement in the Southwest. And there was this major arc of communication around teachers. Ironically enough, the teachers who ended up buying those houses were not DC residents. They were people who relocated because they knew it was happening and got themselves ready for it. Now, now until we get to the point where there is a very public kind of vocabulary lesson, about affordable and housing for the poor, so that people understand, people like me, who teach people <coughs> who are poor and who are trying to make that, that run to get to uh, where they're making a living wage, until we get to understand enough so that we can have those people advocating as specifically as you all do. We're stuck, so how do we get a major community education campaign around housing and how tricky it is in this city and how the cross-cutting issues of race and class have gotten in the way. I saw one of the nastiest conversations right, I've ever seen. Let's let David answer. Yeah. <laughs> so I so appreciate that question. Uh, it is right on time. I mentioned earlier, so there is actually an effort that literally is getting ready to get started around framing conversation in an effective way, uh, a woman, so the housing leaders group I mentioned in Greater Washington, the Greater Washington Partnership, several individual organizations have come together and literally are contracted with a woman named Dr. Tiffany Manuel. who's worked to engage with the Frameworks Institute, used to be a core mine and enterprise, but the point is to develop a public campaign for the region where, because one of the things she's looked at is not just around affordable housing, but in general cause marketing oftentimes uses language that is counterproductive to our cause in a way that was very humbling to me because someone who likes to fancy himself a communicator i was hearing that some of the things that i was saying were actually counterproductive for leaving gaps so anyhow she's going to be engaged she'll be doing focus groups she'll be doing research and the like so and it'll be on a short scale so she's supposed to be, probably get started uh, by february by hopefully May or so, we will have a deliverable. It'll be probably at some public event where folks will be invited to come and get equipped with tools and messaging that electeds can use, residents can use, and others. To, um, so whether we're talking to elected officials, boardrooms, wherever it may be, we can have common language that people can kind of tweak and customize depending on the audience but that is um, kind of grounded in some research that shows it's effective and not just generic research, but also, again, kind of focus groups and feedback on what people in this region are thinking when they hear affordable housing or housing affordability, whatever it may be. All right, it's rare we get such a direct answer to such a great question. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. Thank right. you. I had a question along the lines of what Kimberly was talking about. In DC, there's been issues raised around affordable housing and the quality of it, which you mentioned. So how do you make sure that the housing that's built is actually of quality and that the quality is sustained over time. Like there are things that the developer have to do to sustain that over time. <coughs> yeah, it, I, it's a challenging, it's challenging. I mean, I'd say, um, you know, I think my personal view is that you shouldn't be able to tell, um, you know, who's living in a particular unit. Like, and I know that sometimes 
um, when in, in mixed income neighborhoods or mixed income developments, the uh, the lower the low income units don't have the same um, bells and whistles. Um, so I think there's like sort of universal design or quality of design that um, should be should be instituted and implemented. Um, I I know it's it's an issue of, of, of economics, but design on the front end is really sort of what is going to get you to a level of quality. Um, I've seen projects around the country where there's even different entrances depending on sort of like where you are. I mean, I just I mean that that's appalling to me that there's like you know different like ways into a building. Um, and so again, I mean, I I, I look at it. I'm, I'm very it's it's, it's universal. I, I just think that whatever you're designing, you, it should be the same quality throughout the building. Um, and I think it's possible. I think that that's where developers cut costs um, and you know try to go a little. Uh, they, they go cheaper on the finishes um, of the lower income units. So, you know, I'm sort of going granular here, but I think that it's an, it's an integrated design and that, like, you are creating an environment where, you know, everyone is living together. You can't tell. I mean, that to me is, that's my definition of sort of a successful, successfully designed um, affordable or mixed income property is that you really, there's no difference. Um, so, thank you. Uh, you know, one thing, I mean, I think that the idea is, is how do you build affordable housing? Uh, and building it and maintaining it over time are two different things. She has to about design, though. Yeah, but on the, on the front end, for the design, it's you know kind of getting the resources that can allow for a quality design. And getting money from the low income housing tax credit helps developers uh, build a quality unit. But to maintain that unit over time, the subsidy of the Housing Choice Voucher Program often creates the revenue stream so that who's ever operating the building can maintain it. So often, to have quality affordable housing maintained over time, you gotta have the money to build it and the money to operate it. And that usually means you need two separate subsidies working together. Or you need some income generating um, yes, on the residents. property, yeah, or, or, yeah, to maintain the reserves, because I mean that's usually the issue around maintenance is that you don't have enough in the reserves. Okay, so I, I do see a lot of hands. We're going to go just do one more question, but panelists aren't going anywhere, so come up and ask your questions when we're done. But we'll take this as our last question. Um, <clears throat> real quick before the question, um, <clears throat> as you zone, uh, you have to renew it every two years. Uh, it's usually a, a class of about 50 to 75 people. Uh, I'm going on my fifth year as a zone. I finally met one person who knew someone that was selected. And I ask every time I go to an Aziz zone class, has anyone in here been selected for Aziz zone? Does anyone know someone who's selected for Aziz zone? I found that one person. Unit. Right. Oh. Who was selected to, to be able to, in the lottery, to be able to, uh, rent, to get an Aziz zone. Uh, so my question is, um, how can how can DC residents ensure that uh, the medium income does not continue to be a lie of one hundred and seventeen thousand per year? Um, <laughs> Use the parts of Virginia and Maryland to generate that lie. Great. So whoever answers the question will, can explain it first. Make sure everyone understands. Someone wants to go. Yeah. So when folks talk about area median income, um, standards set by the government looks at large geographic regions, as you said, uh, and so for this area, it, it covers a large region. It looks at usually, when, when people in the industry talk about it, they're usually talking about the median income for a family of four, and then it's indexed for family size. And in this region, one of the issues the gentleman brings up, the challenge is that when you take into consideration um, such a large geography, there are some pockets where in a certain jurisdiction, the actual income level, say, in one area may be less than in Fairfax County, right? Or allowed may be lower than whatever, the next county, that kind of thing, or higher. And so it skews, it can skew when you took. So it's interesting, we actually had this conversation in my shop several years ago, and one of, and one of my colleagues who came from Fannie Mae, her, 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 was getting into 
the challenges from a, um, in terms of how the financing goes and for the bankers who are here or former bankers, reform bankers would <laughs> say that um, um, it gets into issues. That, so at, at one level, the short answer is it's, it's an issue that is dealt with at kind of a, an institutional kind of national level set by, um, by banks, GSEs, and the folks who regulate all of that and the government. So it's at kind of that level. It's not a local DC or Fairfax or Montgomery County issue. It is. A, it makes for a very interesting conversation in terms of um, the underwriting and the implications um, for that and, and what all that means. And so it is. I think it's a conversation worth having. And, and I do think sometimes folks who are kind of of the industry and well-meaning. So I've heard some of them suggest that it, it could actually have a, a negative effect when you index it. So. I, it, it's a good conversation. I think the industry should continue to have. All right. Thank you, David, and thank you, all our panelists. Let's give it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 